The implications stemming from developments in generative artificial intelligence were key topics of discussion at the World Economic Forum in Davos earlier this year. Global professional services consultancy Accenture was especially keen to lead the conversation on AI at Davos and has brought its global chief executive for strategy and consulting to New Zealand to emphasise the AI-induced reinvention the firm is seeing across the globe. His name is Jack Azaguri and he joins me now. Hi, Jack. Hi. Great to be here. Thank you for joining me. So... In terms of the conversation that you're seeing globally yeah. around AI and some of the research and sort of thought leadership work you're doing, what what, what are some of the big you know, concerns that you're seeing amongst the, 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 the boards and the CEOs out there? Yeah, I mean, it is um, the number one topic of conversation right now with our clients globally. Um, and one of the things that, that we see, we, we, um, we run an, an index uh, around the level of disruption we see globally every year. We run it just before Davos, actually. And we saw since 2019, a 187% increase in the level of disruption that business are facing. Just to put it in the context, before 2019, it was four or 5%, so basically flat. So companies are dealing with a lot more uncertainty, a lot more disruption, level of change, is, the pace of change is much higher. And the interesting thing about this year, technology went from number five on the disruption index to number one. And generative AI is obviously one of the driving force. And number two on our index was talent. And so generative AI and talent top agendas in terms of what our clients need to deal with. But um, generative AI is obviously tremendous uh, implications for, for all of our clients, tremendous opportunity uh, to transform and to reinvent. And we and most of our clients are investing in some way, shape or form in generative AI. Mm. To what extent do you see people who are or companies that are, are, you know, trying to keep up, and then there's those who are perhaps leading, as you say, reinventing yeah. versus, I suppose, offensive and defensive strategies. To, yeah. yeah. So what we see, first of all, when, um, uh, we published a piece of research on reinvention, and uh, we started last year uh, to talk about reinvention and published a report in 2023 and then again in 2024. And we see a group of about 8% last year, 9% of the companies this year uh, that we call reinventors that are pulling away from the pack with much higher revenue growth and much higher value across other dimensions. We call it 360 value, sustainability, customer sat, operational improvement. Um, and this year in the research, they're actually pulled away from the other companies we call the transformers. The only group that's catching up are groups that are deploying Gen AI at a much more rapid pace and broader across the enterprise. And so we see Gen AI as the number one lever now for reinvention. Now, if we look at our clients, I would say 80 to 90% of our clients are deploying generative AI in pilot mode. They're starting with 100, sometimes 200 ideas, getting down to 50 and experimenting with Gen AI. And that experimentation phase is important. Learn the technology, learn the boundaries, start to adopt, uh, you know, adopt responsible AI practices, uh, train the, the employee population. We're now entering the second phase of generative AI for many of our clients, which is deploying it at scale. Take one part of the enterprise, really look at how Gen AI is going to reinvent the entire process end to end, and then deploy the capabilities, match it with t training, match it with a talent strategy, responsible and embedded throughout. And so we view this as, you know, we're now in part two of this Gen AI transformation for many of our clients mm. that are really deploying it at scale, leading with value, leading with how does it affect my customer or my employee and then working backwards to transform the end-to-end -end experience? Do you see them prioritizing what kind of parts of the business? I mean, maybe something that's not quite so mission critical or some are going into that area? So most, so as of January, when we were, as of January, we'd done about 700 projects. We're over that now. Um, and the parts of high emphasis, we call these the no regret areas, are sales, customer service, marketing, and information technology. So transforming call center experience, transforming the process of uh, marketing and creative, uh, the creative process in marketing, uh, supporting sales executives with Gen AI. And then in information technology, it's a massive boost to productivity. We see a lot of companies that have uh, large uh, legacy estates with mainframe and you know, COBOL code using generative, generative AI to transfer that code to cloud native applications. So those are what I call the, the no regret areas. Um, in most cases, the data uh, requirements on those are a little bit less than other, values, other parts of the value chain. 
Now, when we look at our reinventors, they're a little broader across the value chain. And yes, they're focused on those no regret areas, but they're also focused on areas that are a little core, more at the core of the enterprise, and actually we have more and have more complex data requirements, supply chain, procurement, manufacturing, engineering, research and development. Uh, those require a more mature data layer, and but we see the reinventors applying themselves more, you know, relatively more in that part of the value chain and having a more balanced view across the enterprise. Mm-hmm. In terms of the service providers in the in the generative AI yeah. space, you know, we're talking about the big ones, Microsoft with OpenAI and Google. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're talking about perhaps a, a gap between players in the industry, then those those big ones who have the the data and the capability to form the big gen of AI, AI models yeah. must be opening an even wider gap, perhaps to other service providers or, um, below them. I think what I would what I would advise clients is the importance of partnership now is greater than ever. Mm. So figuring out your ecosystem partners, um, you know, because not every company can invest at a massive scale in generative AI. And so having a clear partnership strategy, understanding where in your ecosystem they're going to play is critically important. That's, that's the number one, the first thing I would, I would emphasize. The second thing is that um, we're seeing new LLMs pop up, pop up every week. And we're seeing now that smaller LLMs with focused knowledge, focused level of information on a specific domain can actually perform very, very well. You don't need a general purpose model uh, that can answer everything from geography uh, to questions on on geopolitics to questions around you know uh, you know pharmaceuticals to in some areas you want to a more purpose built model with a smaller data set that can actually these models are starting to perform at very high accuracy and get trained in just just in the legal profession or in you know, life sciences or in et cetera. Um, and so access to specialized models uh, is bringing down the cost bar for LLMs uh, and also the energy consumption bar for LLMs. So um, I would say, yes, have a partnering strategy, very, very important, but monitor the evolution of these models and we're starting to see smaller models be more accessible. The last thing I would say is that companies will need to have a flexible strategy with large language models. You may use one large language model for one application, but you may use a different one for a different one, and in six different applica- and in six months you may need a, th- a different model altogether. And so understanding what models you need based on latency, based on energy consumption, based on the cost profile, based on the domain specialization is very, very important. I mean, there are over 700 models out there today. Mm. So it is a, actually a complex space. It's both a democratized technology and a complex space. Mm. So, well, I, I suppose it reflects also in the market for, um, for for startups who are using the tools as well. Correct. And, and, and you know, services, um, uh, software as a service, and, and apps. Um, interested in what you're seeing in terms of the, I suppose the, the M and A market or the capital market for these businesses that are coming up. They, they kind of have to use AI from what I'm being told that, you know, if you've got a startup at the moment, it has to be an AI dimension to it or at least be thinking about it. Um, I th- yeah, I think whether it's a startup or a, a large, you know, large enterprise, I think you have to have and use the word offensive and defensive. You, ha- you need to understand both your offensive and your defensive posture with uh, regards to Gen AI. So if you're investing in a startup, first question, are they going to be disrupted by Gen AI? And if so, how? Right, and what is the opportunity for them to disrupt their market with Gen AI? So if you're investing in a company in the life sciences space, right, the process of molecule discovery with Gen AI is gonna be transformed. So is that organization investing there? Uh, if you're investing in a software company, all their software products should have a Gen AI roadmap. But you also need to understand the, the defensive, what part of their enterprise is gonna be disrupted and how they're adapting uh, to that. Great, okay, well thanks very much for giving us your insights, Jack. Thanks for your time. For more content just like this and all the latest business and political news, head over to mbr.co.nz.